everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, Becoming a Synodal Church, Issues and Challenges. It's my sincere pleasure, pleasure to introduce our speaker. Nathalie Bequois is a Catholic religious sister and member of the Congregation of Xavier, a French in Ignatian-inspired order. Sister Bequois graduated from the HEC School of Management, Paris, in 1992 with a master's in entrepreneurship. She obtained a double canonical baccalaureate degree in philosophy and theology in 2006 from the Jesuit Seminary in Paris, supplemented by training in sociology at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris between 2004 and 2006. In 2019 to 2020, she specialized in ecclesiology, doing research on synodality here at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. For 25 years, she was involved in youth ministry and served as director of the National Service for the Evangelization of Youth and Vocations of the French Bishops Conference from 2012 to 2018. Sister Bequois made significant contributions to the Synod of Bishops 2018 General Assembly on young people, the faith and vocational discernment, serving as a coordinator of the pre-Synod, a speaker and as an observer. In May 2019, she was appointed a consultor to the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops, along with four other women and one man. It was the first time for women to be appointed to that position. On February 6, 2021, Sister Bequois was appointed by Pope Francis as Undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops, making her the first woman to have the right to vote in the Catholic Synod of Bishops. This appointment is seen as a watershed moment in the Catholic Church and an indication of an increased role for women in the life of the church. Very few women have as much, to, as much say as Sister Bequois on shaping the future of the church. She was appointed a member of the Dicastery for Communication in December 2021. A lecturer and trainer, she is the author of numerous publications on synodality and synods, Young People and Youth Ministry, Vocations and Religious Life, The Church and Mission. One of our own, it is indeed a great honor and pleasure to have her back at Boston College with us today. Welcome, Sister Bequa. Well, thank you so much, Father Michael, and also Megan and Cara for the organization. And thank you all uh, to be there and also those who are online. It's really a great, great pleasure to be back to one of my alma mater. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for my time in uh, Boston College in, uh, when I was there for this research. And I can say I'm very impressed to speak here because I still feel I am a student. I'm still learning. And I have so much great professors and staff who are here who could really speak better than me about synodality. But uh, I was asked to share with you a reflection, so I will do it. I um, ask you to be patient also because I'm a little bit tired with the time change and so much work, but I will try to, to do my best. Uh, as we are all together living a synod, you know, one year ago, the synod on for a synodal church communion participation mission has been opened by Pope Francis in Rome and one week after in all the dioceses all over the world. And we are still journey, trying to journey together as this uh, logo is trying to uh, express it. So as we are on this journey that has just been extended by Pope Francis, maybe you have learned that the Angelus two or three weeks ago he announced, that uh, there will be two sessions 
to assembly in Rome, not only in October 23, but also October 24, because to become a synodal church, our topic is uh, not easy. <laughs> it's not in one day, in two months, or even in two years. It's a long process. My master in ecclesiology, uh, Yves Congar, used to say the reform of the church is a matter of one generation and uh, it's a collective uh, uh, act. It's nobody alone. So I'm very aware that if I can speak with you tonight, if we can continue this journey, it's really all together. It's no one alone. So to introduce uh, this uh, presentation with you, that it will not be a very academic lecture. I will try <laughs> to do this with maybe a synodal style that is to share with you more a reflection on the move as we are still learning and a synodal church, the first issue is to become a learning church. And maybe you, you can see that Pope Francis has really a thought in motion that is always open. It's never uh, fixed <laughs> and stopped. So we, as we are leaving this synod, we continue to unfold what synodality uh, is, really, because it deals with the mystery of the church and we haven't finished to discover. And when I was uh, blessed to do this research here and to go to STM, it was just uh, after the Synod on Young People that for me has been a wonderful experience, very deep transformative experience. And I came with this practice and I did uh, my research and my thesis by beginning to listen to the experience of the Synod. And I think, and I try to do theology <laughs> from, uh, since I began, uh, from the practice, and what I will try to share with you is really, and I hope, uh, could uh, foster uh, and come back uh, to uh, the members of the people of God so that we continue. It's, it's not to be, re so the goal is not to write a book, but really to live, uh, to experience synodality. Because the big difficulty is that synodality is a learning by doing. It's a learning by experience. That was one of the main output of my research. So I'm always happy to talk about it, but it's not enough. <laughs> it's uh, just to invite you to uh, live synodality through an experience. So I will try uh, today to share with you where we are as we are uh, in this synod, we just begin, maybe you have seen that today was a special day because this morning, 12 uh, in Rome, noon in Rome, but six o'clock here, it was a press conference to release the new document for the continental stage of the synod. <coughs> And uh, I would like to begin by uh, sharing a little bit about the synodal methodology that is really a journey, referring to the symbolic image of the youth synod to express synodality that came through the experience of the synod in October 18 in Rome with the synodal fathers, the young people who was there. It was the image of Emmaus. And uh, the experience of synodality, and that was my experience, and not only me, also with all the synodal father, we had the experience that Jesus Christ was walking with us like he was walking with the disciple of Emmaus. This is the way <laughs> to, uh, to do a, a synodal journey. We can say it's like Christ with the pilgrims of Emmaus. And this Emmaus road uh, is a good expression of what is the synodal methodology. It begins with the reality, the sea, <laughs> listening to the reality, recognizing the reality. So it's starting from our starting point from our situateness, from the very concrete reality where we are. And then looking at this reality, trying to interpret it in the light of the gospel, uh, it's a church, in uh, then 
we are called to act, to discern, and to choose. So that's a way uh, to do uh, synodality. And at this time, through this synod and synodality, uh, I will share with you on this special day where we have released the document for the continental stage. It's a document that is trying to give back what has been listened all over the world in all uh, the local churches, all the country, um, to restitute to the people uh, what is coming from the people of God, the voice of the people of God. So the first phase of the Synod was like the beginning of the journey of Emmaus. Jesus is just listening to the disciples where they are on their road, their disillusion, uh, their questions. And we are doing that today, so referring to the methodology of the reading of the sign of the times from the Second Vatican Council, because really we can say there is a very strong link between synod, synodality, and the council. And you know that we have just uh, celebrated the 60th anniversary of the council. So the Synod of Bishops, where I'm working now, uh, is in some manner the image of an ecumenical council and reflects its spirit and method. And our understanding of synodality through this experience of this synod, in fact, I think is really rooted in the Second Vatican Council and also help us to understand better what was the Council as an event, as a process, as a spiritual event, not only some texts, that's very important to read them. So we can't understand and live synodality today without referring to the Council, but I think also that our experience helps us to continue the reception of the Council in a way Maybe we are living all together as Bataille, something that the council fathers have experienced as bishops uh, through this collegiality. So the synod is really a fruit of the council, and I think we already see that, but uh, it will, it's the main issue. I think one of the main issues, it's a way to advance the reception of the Council. And for this anniversary, our Secretariat has released a message saying that the Synod, which represents a fruit of that ecumenical assembly, indeed one of its most precious legacies, um, is uh, ready a fruit. And you know, the Synod of Bishop was instituted during the last session of the Council in September 1965. So we are ready uh, a way, an instrument to continue in a way the experience of the Council. And nowadays, uh, what is very interesting is that the Synod is not only a Synod of Bishop, and our Secretariat is no longer the Secretariat of the Synod of Bishop. The name has changed with the new constitution uh, on the Roman Curia, Predicate Evangelium. If you look at it, it is written the Secretariat of the Synod. <laughs> Why? We will try to uh, explore that. Because if the concept of synodality is not expressed like this in the document of the Council, we can say today, as uh, an Australian theologian, Armand Rush, is stating, that synodality is the Council in a nutshell. So it's a way to embrace all the output of the Council and to put it into practice. To explore more what is synodality, I would like to refer to synodality as a dynamic vision of the church in history. Because as you know, the Council was really maybe the main shift with the Council was to integrate the historical dimension into the conception of the revelation, into the way of, law, of uh, envisioning the, the church. So uh, not in just a theoretical abstract way, but synodality is the realization of the church in history as communion and mission. That's why we can't speak or live synodality without a very incarnated 
practical uh, experience because it's not about the church uh, in imagination or in, a, in, in theoretically, it's about the church of today in that world, in that context, in this culture. Synodality is the dynamic dimension, the historical dimension of ecclesial communion founded by Trinitarian communion, which appreciating simultaneously the sensus fidei of all God's holy faithful people, apostolic collegiality of all the bishop, and unity with the successor of Peter must animate the conversion and reform of the church at every level. It is because we look at the church in history, the church as a Pilgrim, uh, in a pilgrimage on this earth, going uh, with the, the vision of going to uh, the Father, that the church has to uh, be reformed and is a, on a path of conversion, Ecclesia Semper Reformada, because on is, uh, the historic and human dimension of the church it's always a path of conversion. So synodality, referring to the Gentium, is the form which the Spirit gives to the people of God in the world. So it's a very, uh, we can say, concrete uh, vision of the church in history, really rooted in the vision of the Trinitarian God. The, the matrix of synodality, we can say, is the mystery of the Trinity. As it is stated, it is this important document, Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church, that was published by the International Theological Commission in March 2018. Synodality manifests the pilgrim character of the Church. The image of the people of God gathered from among the nations expresses its social, historical, and missionary character which corresponds to the condition and vocation of each human person as homo viator. The past is the image that clarifies our understanding of the mystery of Christ as the way that leads to the Father. Jesus is the way from God to man and from man to God. The graceful event whereby he made himself a pilgrim by pitching his tent among us goes on in the synodal path of the church. So to understand synodality, we have to be on the journey as pilgrim. And I would dream to do this lecture uh, just walking together with you outside. It would, be, it would give a better, uh, a better understanding. But I invite you to uh, catch up this image of pitching a stunt among us, and you will see why. So uh, if we look at synodality, and that uh, will be the end of my introduction, we can see it as an integral ecclesiology, a very broad approach of uh, ecclesiology, of the vision of the church. And the call today uh, that has been discerned through the reception of the Second Vatican Council, and especially uh, under the pontificate of Pope Francis, we have understood that synodality has to shape the whole life and mission of the church, all her dimension. So if we understand that, you understand why we are really uh, called to become a synodal church, and this synod, as Pope Francis is stating in his address for the opening of the synod, is to move not occasionally, but structurally towards a synodal church. That means to become a, listen a listening church and uh, to be a synodal church as an open square where all can be feel at home and participate. It's not about creating an other church, but to create a different church, a new style of church, retrieving this dynamic identity of the church as a church on the way, <laughs> a journey, a church in which all together we journey as missionary pilgrim um, to uh, foster communion, 
to uh, call everybody to participate for the mission, that means for the service of the world. So the aim of this synod is very simple and very clear. It's to relearn synodality, because in a way, synodality was uh, the style of the early church. <laughs> And you can refer to the first council or the first synod, the book of the Act of the Apostle, chapter 15. There is a big conflict in the community. They don't agree. <laughs> what do they do? They gather together, they pray together, they listen to each other, and they try to find a consensus. And at the end, they say, the Holy Spirit and us have decided that those who are not yet Jews won't have to be circumcised to follow Christ. Uh, I invite you to, to reread this passage. So we have to relearn synodality in a way as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council, but uh, to retrieve what was uh, from the beginning of the church because this synod is really to help us to integrate that synodality is a constitutive dimension of the church. Uh, of course, there is a hierarchical principle of the, in the church, but there is also a synodal uh, principle. So it's about the synodal conversion of the church, and the difficulty, as I have said, is that it's, uh, we can't uh, learn synodality in a book or in a classroom. <laughs> it's uh, through the practice, through this experience of working together as people of missionary pilgrims. And the only way to learn synodality and to foster synodality and to implement synodality is to reread our experience of journeying together and to discern what should be the next step. And what we, are, what we see is that through all the experience of the synodal process all over the world, all those who have been part of listening sessions, synodal consultation, at the end they say, through this process, we have discovered that synodality is a way of being church. In fact, it is the way of being church. The Holy Spirit is asking us to be more synodal. So they integrate that what Pope Francis has already stated in one of his key texts in uh, September 2015, it's ju not just a, a nice text and a call for Pope Francis, but it's a call from the Holy Spirit, and we all have to, uh, to, to move forward. So really the purpose is not to write documents, even if today I will speak about an important document, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, as it is uh, stated in the end of the preparatory document of the Synod, I, I think many of you have read it, that it is to plan dreams, draw forth prophecies and vision, allow hope to flourish, inspire trust, bind up wounds with together relationships, awaken a down of hope, learn from one another and create a bright resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm hearts, give strength to our hands and inspire a vision of the future filled with the joy of the gospel. And you can read here into, in a way that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of synodality are nothing else than the fruit of uh, the Holy Spirit. So there is, uh, you know, the, the Synod is guided by this fundamental question, how are we already journeying together and what is the next step? And to uh, achieve this uh, goal that is helping the Synodal Conversion of the Church, the Synod has been designed in different stages. So we have finished this summer the first stage, the local consultation at the diocesan and national level. And now we are entering into the continental phase. So my talk to, today will refer to this uh, stage before going to the, the assembly in Rome in October 23 and the second session in October 24. And then there will be the reception of the implementation. But today is a special day for the Synod, and we can say not only for the Synod, I think for the Church, because many have stated that this Synod that is uh, 
that is convoking everybody in the church. It's really an historical event, maybe the most important after the council. And today was released the, what we call the document for the continental stage. So I have a copy here. Uh, that is a kind of synthesis or feedback of all the synthesis coming from all over the world. Uh, and we have drafted this text with a, with a team. And the title of this, take, uh, of this text is, that is uh, saying a lot that listening to all these voices of the people of God, what has been heard and uh, what we have received is uh, that we understand that the Holy Spirit is asking the church to enlarge the space of the tent. And it's a reference to um, Isaiah uh, 54. So this document uh, is coming from contribution from 112 out of 114 Episcopal conferences. So it's a main achievement. All the synod before, there was some consultation, but not so broad. And it's the first time that we have almost 100% of all the bishops' conference, but also Oriental churches, the casteries from the Roman Curia, then uh, many contributions from religious communities that came through the Union of uh, Superior General, many also associations and lay movement of faithful, and more than 1,000 uh, contributions from individual and groups, many from the United States. So all this has been read, and through a process of 12 days with a group of experts, and Rafael Luciani was there, so he can also talk about it, uh, we have discerned how to restitute and to uh, give back the voice of the, of the people. So what we can see is really that through this process, what people have experienced, synodality has ceased to be an abstract concept for them and has become a concrete experience. And when they have tested it, its flavor, they want to continue to do so. So the first fruit is that when you experience synodality, you want to continue and to share it uh, with the other. So really, this process, we can say, is a kind of appropriation personal and communal appropriation of the call for synodality that uh, will no longer remain as uh, just a text, but will be carried on by uh, all the people. And uh, I try not only to share about the process, but to reread it with a theological reflection. And I think we can understand that in the culture of today, and uh, all my experience with young people really uh, highlighted that, there is a centrality of experience in the culture of today. What people want uh, is to have a lively, a living experience of faith, a living experience of church, and not just an abstract uh, concept. So that's the parading of Emmaus. And the, maybe the main output, what we are discovering, is that not only young people want a synodal church, because that was the main fruit of the synod on young people. Through the synod on young people, we have understood that the only way to transmit the faith today in the world that we know with so many crises uh, is synodality. But now we understand that not only the young people ask us to work together, not only young people have expressed the desire to be involved, to participate, to have a synodal church, but it's all, all kind uh, of members of the people of God who call uh, the church to practice synodality as a way of being and acting, promoting the participation of all the baptized and of people of goodwill, each according to his age, state of life, and vocation. So it's very interesting to see that in a way, what is this in this document is mainly what was already in the final document of the Youth Synod. And uh, in Christus Vivit, you can, the post-synodal exhortation, you can read that youth pastoral has to be synodal, 
And now you can understand that not only youth pastoral, but all kind of pastoral has to be uh, synodal. So you see, we are really in this process that help people to recognize the call to a synodal conversion. And here I quote uh, a letter from the general superiors of the religious order, but as, just as an example, who really uh, commit themselves uh, to this synodal conversion because they recognize this call. So the first issue one of the main issues for synodality that I want to, to share with you is really to understand, and we can say to receive and integrate, that synodality is a call of God. As Pope Francis says, it is the way of being the church today, according to the will of God in a dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it's not a matter, I like it or I don't like it, I want to do it or I don't want to do it. Uh, I'm comfortable with this vision or I'm completely uh, reluctant to do it. It's a matter of really uh, uh, answering the call, the will of God and doing the will of God. Uh, and I think as the journey is really not easy <laughs> because it's a process of change and, and transformation, if we don't root uh, the code of synodality very deeply <laughs> like this, uh, we can be uh, discouraged or uh, we can stop. But if it's really rooted at this level, that is the spiritual level, because we have discerned that synodality is uh, the way to be church today, and discernment is at the earth of uh, synodality, then we can be confident that we will receive the grace to answer the call of God because that's always the, the way. So really the challenge, and I hope that is already your experience or that will be your experience. I can really testimony that was my experience at the Synod on Youth. It is to live a new Pentecost, <laughs> to receive uh, a new impetus for the mission, uh, for our faith. And the Synod is and has to be an event of grace. And really reading all the synthesis, I can tell you, I have uh, at, at, Frascas at Frascati, with this exercise of praying, discerning, with the voices of all the people of God in the synthesis, I had a very, very deep uh, personal spiritual experience because I think that through this, something of the presence of God is given to us through this process. And at the end, uh, and that's why at the end of the introduction of this text, we have written this prayer, because at the end, we had the experience that the synthesis, those pages were like a holy ground. And we were like Moses uh, with the, the fire. Uh, and this text is coming from an experience of God, an experience of church, and is supposed to be given back to help people to continue uh, to walk uh, close to this uh, holy ground. So now I would like to enter a little bit into this text, but not only just to present you the text, but also some uh, theological uh, reflection. So the first part, is about the experience of uh, synodality, the experience of the synodal journey. As I told you from the beginning, and we can emphasize that, that synodality is a pilgrim style, and I would like here to quote also a member of our Commission on Theology, uh, Carlos Galli, one of the main uh, theologians in Latin America, and he says, today synodality designates the pilgrim style of the Church of of Christ as she journeys through history towards the Father's house and discerns her evangelizing mission in the communion of the Holy Spirit. It points out the path that the people of God travels with the plural unity of its local churches 
members and communities through the convergent exercise of their charisms and ministries at the service of the common good. I think it rather dense, but it condenses what is synodality. And uh, in fact, that's also what uh, came from the experience uh, of the, the people of God and, and through the, the synthesis, because uh, when they give feedback on their experience of the synodal journey, they say, for instance, that the message of our synodal way is simple. We are learning to walk together and sit together to break the one bread in such a way that each is able to find their place. Everyone is called to take part in this journey. No one is excluded. So to this, we feel called so that we can credibly proclaim the gospel of Jesus to all people. And this path that has been experienced is also the path that uh, will be deepened during this uh, continental stage. And what people have experienced, it's listening to one another, participating, engaging a dialogue, uh, and uh, also especially uh, raising the voices of the laity. Um, and, and that's uh, the goal, we can say, of synodality. So the experience of the synodal journey is first a spiritual experience of synodality, that is an experience of conversion, metanoia. And I can testimony not only for myself, but all those who are involved, that it's a path of kenosis, because if you really let space for the other, if you really journey with people from different colors, different uh, states, different positions, different backgrounds, it's not easy, you know that. And you have uh, to uh, really let uh, space for the other. And it, you can only do that if you are rooted in the listening of the word of God. So uh, with key attitudes, spiritual attitudes for synodality. So we can't experience synodality if we are not uh, open, we can say, to a spiritual experience that requires faith and trust in God, humility, prayer, uh, dialogue and sharing, inner freedom also to, to speak. So in a way, the experience of the synod uh, process uh, is like a, uh, what we have read and see is like a photography of the concrete life of Christian communities on the ground from all over the world. And what was very moving was also to see and to read that people in countries like uh, with war, uh, like Lebanon, big uh, crisis, Myanmar, Haiti, uh, Congo, you know, even in the midst of so much difficulties, conflicts and violence, kidnapping, they say, we are doing the synodal process. Uh, and where people have experienced that, and I will quote a bishop from the United States with whom I had a conversation, who told me, this synod is changing my vision of evangelization. As a bishop, as a priest, I have been trained to teach, to preach, to tell the truth. Through all this experience of listening, and he has done uh, in many places in his diocese, I realize that the spirit is already at work in all these people. This synod is really changing my vision of evangelization. So uh, we can see that the synod, in fact, is a transformative process. That's what we have heard. And uh, how this transformative process is happening, it's happening through a process of daring to name the reality with the joys and the sorrows, with the light and the shades, with uh, the good experience, but also the difficulties, the suffering. And <clears throat> daring to share that, to name it, <laughs> to start with the reality, you experience a process that is opening uh, a road. <laughs> uh, and uh, so this document 
is uh, composed in uh, different chapters. The first one is about the experience of the synod. And at the end, what emerged is a profound reappropriation of the common dignity of all baptized. Uh, the fact and that everybody was asked to give his voice, and sometimes in many countries it was the first time, and people say, oh, you know, it's the first time the church is asking me uh, what I think. And through that, I realized that the church is not only the priest and the bishops, but uh, we are part of, uh, of the church. What came very strongly is that uh, many people feel they don't really have, uh, they don't really feel the church uh, being welcoming. Many people feel they are not listened to and they say it, they feel on the margins, so it's coming very strongly, but all ask for a more welcoming church a more inclusive church, a relational church, open, a church, uh, as Pope Francis says, as a field hospital. That's why we have understood and interpret the, uh, the call as a call to uh, enlarge the space of the tent. Uh, and that's uh, chapter two. And then, very important, uh, when you open the floor to everybody and you listen to everybody, you won't have the same uh, answers, as you know. So you will have a lot of diversity and uh, many opposite views. That's part of the synod and it's a call to embrace the tensions. We, can, we can't do synodality without facing and dealing with the tensions and receiving them as generative tensions, not being afraid about the diversity and the tensions. So the chapter three is about uh, five, we can say, generative tensions that we have read uh, through the process. Listening that becomes welcoming, sisters and brothers for the mission, communion, participation, and co-responsibility, synodality takes shape also in structure and synodal life and liturgy. And the chapter four is about the methodology for the continental stage. So I will go now very uh, quickly because I have prepared too many slides, but I will uh, sh let my PowerPoint with you. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what I really want, maybe if there is only one thing you can uh, take away after this, I would like that you, you are confident that the, really, the spirit is ready at work. Because at the end, that's what we have contemplated. And even in the US, and we have so many uh, feedback from that. And that the experience of synodality is first an experience of the spirit, a formative experience, an experience of dialogue, encounters, and relationship. Here, I share with you some results of my research about the synod on young people. <laughs> but what I have discovered is also now what I read uh, in, uh, in the synthesis. So you can see that there is a positive impact of the synodal experience because when people practice it, they want to continue it and they discover that it deepened their own identity. For instance, we know that many priests are a little bit re are resistant or afraid of the synodal process because they say, and then what will be the, our role? But when they really leave it, at the end they say, oh, leaving that and rediscovering that we are not separated from the people, but we are called to, uh, we have a co-responsibility with them. We are called to carry on the mission with all the faithful. We rediscover our own vocation and we deepen our own identity. And this gives to the participants, to those who are embracing synodality, a new vision of the church with a greater love for and greater commitment to the church, and then they endorse synodality and they change the approach in ministry. And they say, I can just become 
a synodal priest, a synodal theologian, a synodal sister, a synodal catechist <laughs> with this new uh, style that is a collaborative style. So you can really see the impact uh, of the synod even, and you can read in the document also all the difficulties and we know, you know, I, uh, I don't think I need to <laughs> spend a lot of time on the difficulties and challenges, uh, there are many. So this first part of the document try to highlight the fruits, the seeds, and the weeds of synodality in a very frankly way. <laughs> uh, we don't have to put this under the carpet, but uh, to look at it. But really, uh, and I want to highlight that, in a way, the experience of synodality help everybody to retrieve the common baptismal dignity and the fact that first we are all baptized and called uh, before any of our differences. So you can see that synodality is a process in a way of empowerment for the all people of God to achieve co-responsibility, not only in the text, but then uh, in all our uh, uh, church uh, places so that we can really carry on the mission together. So in a way, this synod on synodality, as uh, this theologian is stating, Monsignor Piero Coda, uh, is not a synod about a team like other, but on the deeper identity of the church as communion and mission that becomes concrete, historically incisive when it is participated by all. The church is such, in fact, only when it is carried on its shoulder by all and shared in its earth by all at the service of its brothers and sisters, especially beginning with the last, the discarded, and the existential and spiritual peripheries of our time. And so this experience, in a way, we can say, um, ecclesialize us and help us to uh, understand better or to experience better the mystery of the church and our own identity as Bataille, that is part of the people of God. So to do that and to experience synodality, uh, the way is very uh, clear, but not easy. <laughs> it is to listen, to become a listening church. <laughs> and uh, sometimes images express that more than a big speech. And uh, to do that, it is not only a reciprocal listening, but also a listening to the scriptures. Because uh, through the scriptures, we, we, that's the way also God uh, is coming uh, uh, to us. And in a way, listening is not just a human um, way. <laughs> it is the way God is entering into relationships with us as a human being. And we have different images of synodality. Uh, and uh, that, that are trying to express what is this path of listening. Pope Francis, you know, speak about the invert pyramid. Uh, it's uh, also uh, the image as the church as a family, the road of Emmaus, the New Pentecost. I have already spoken about it. But uh, the Synod on Youth gave the image of the tent of meeting in which the Ark of the Covenant is preserved, a dynamic church in movement which accompanies while journeying, strengthened by many charisms and ministry. Thus does God make himself present in this world. And you, you see that this image, in fact, is uh, resonating with the image that came through all this synod, uh, enlarge the space of your tent. And there is a second image that you can find into the, so the chapter two of the document, that is the image of the grain of wheat 
I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. And it is trying to express what I have said, that the synod as a spiritual process is really a path of kenosis, like Jesus in Philippians 2, uh, who empty himself, uh, taking the form of a slave coming in human likeness because Jesus don't want to impose himself, but with his incarnation, though he was in the form of God, uh, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself. So that's the way for us, and uh, that's a Pascal journey, and that's the biggest challenge because we know it's it's not uh, it's not easy, and that's the only way uh, to enlarge the space uh, of the tent. Uh, that is uh, what we have to do when we listen, when we listen really the other, to also listen to the Holy Spirit. That means we open our heart. <laughs> Uh, to let uh, the word of the other really touch us, transform us. It's always a risk to, to listen. And uh, this is how many reports envision the church, an expansive but not homogeneous dwelling, capable of sheltering all but open, letting in and out, and moving toward embracing the Father and all of humanity. So we see that, in a way, through this uh, synodal experience and with this call uh, to be a synodal church, that is really the vocation of the church for the third millennium, because that's the only way to continue to proclaim the gospel in this world. We are, and sometimes I feel that our role as the secretary of the synod and all of those who are engaged in the synod, we are like midwife to accompany the path of a new birth of the church with also labor pain <laughs> to get rid of a clerical church and uh, to become um, a synodal church. So now, I want to move to the chapter three of this document with also some uh, reflection towards a missionary synodal church, just to highlight a little bit some uh, of the main, um, some of the main uh, themes uh, that you can feel uh, and that are uh, coming from, uh, so from the, the experience and the listening of the voices of the people of God. Uh, we express that, uh, you know, the church home does not have doors that close, but perimeter that continually widens. So the call is really uh, to leave better the tension of truth and mercy and uh, to offer a witness of radical inclusion and acceptance through so its pastoral and discerning accompaniment. So a synodal church is this inclusive church that is open to radical inclusion of all the diversity of the people of God, including those who already feel on the, on the margin. And as I have said, that is really about facing differences and conflicts, embracing generative tensions, and Pope Francis give us, uh, help us, we can say, uh, to achieve this goal through working together, not so much to forge agreement as to recognize, honor, and reconcile differences on a higher plane where the best of each can be retained. In the dynamic of a synod, differences are expressed and polished until you reach, if not consensus, a harmony that holds on the sharp notes of its difference. That is what happens in music. So uh, the synod experience allows us to work together, not just in spite of our differences, but seeking the truth and taking on the richness of the polar tensions at stake. So it is learning to become one, to live the unity of the church, with and through the diversity. 
not being a monocolor uh, church. And for that, as I have already said, you really need to have a listening that becomes welcoming, especially listening to the poor, because if you can really listen to the voiceless and to the poor, that's a guarantee that you are open to listen to uh, everybody. And in a way, uh, the key, we can say, for the synodal process is really to open space and to listen to the poorest, to the people on the margin. And we can see when we really listen to them, maybe they won't speak like uh, in a very theological, ordered way, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is speaking through them. Many of you have this experience. And they bring back us to the essential. And when the church is focused on the mission and on the listening of the poor, uh, it's the best way to build communion and uh, to, be, to be the church. So it's a call, uh, you know, really to be sisters and brothers for mission. Not sometimes, you know, many people uh, laugh and uh, are very cynical with the synod and they say it's a synod on the synod on the synodality and the synodality and uh, no, <laughs> it, it's a synod uh, <clears throat> for uh, the service of humanity, for the society <laughs> to help us as church to uh, face the most important uh, problems of our world the ecological, the climate change, uh, violence, polarization. Uh, and to do that, we can't do it alone. Uh, we, we have to do it with the other. And I can say that you find all the principles and the roadmap for synodality in Laudato Si <laughs> and in Fratelli Tutti. We can say the vision of Laudato Si Everything is connected. The vision of, Laudat, of Fratelli Tutti, all are, uh, no, Laudato Si, every, everything is, uh, yes, interrelated. Fratelli Tutti, all are connected, is uh, the roadmap for synodality. The only way to uh, do the ecological conversion and to implement Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti is really uh, to be a synodal church. And in Vangeli Gaudium, we have the same, the principles that Pope Francis is giving us. And one of the very strong call that is coming from the synodal experience that you will read also in this document is a call to foster ecumenism. Because to face all these problems for the mission, we can't do it alone, and we have to do it with our brothers and sisters of other denominations, but even of other, religi uh, other religions. So synodality goes with a style of uh, journeying with all the people of God <laughs> and fostering ecumenism and uh, interreligious uh, dialogue. And that's really, in a way, uh, it's, we can say the path for the unity of Christians, in a way, is the same path uh, as the path of synodality. So there is a very strong ecumenical dimension uh, in, uh, in this synod. Then uh, another point very important about communion participation and co-responsibility. Another way to speak about uh, synodality is co-responsibility <laughs> uh, and implementing co-responsibility. And for that, uh, what comes very, very strongly from all the synthesis from all over the world, so many different contexts, is the question of women and the need to value co-responsibility between men and women based on equality and reciprocity because we have this common equal dignity as baptized men and women together. That was already a very strong call coming from the Synod on Youth and the Synod on the Amazon, but with this Synod, it's really <laughs> one of the main, main, main issue and topic 
coming uh, from everywhere, and you can uh, read that. So uh, there is no other way to live a synodal style than to reflect on the condition and role of women within it, and consequently in society more generally. So there is a strong part on the participation of women, not only women in the church, but it is also first a question of women in the men and women in the society, and many women ask the church to be their allies to face discrimination uh, in um, in the society. So that's really uh, one of a uh, very very important topic. Then. Uh, you have a part on, we can say, uh, how synodality takes shape. So you have also to look at the structures. And uh, it means also that this synod can, uh, is asking for looking at our canon law and maybe change some part that's, uh, that's open. Because there is really a need for structures and processes to implement the way of co-responsibility. And you know that uh, to re-rigorate collegial bodies and our synodal institutions that are already there, but many are not mandatory. So it's up to the pastor to have a parish council or to the bishops to have uh, different uh, councils. Uh, and maybe there is also a need uh, to create new structures to express and practice co-responsibility. In that sense, uh, for the, to, to become more synodal, there are already many things we can implement in a Catholic university, in, the, uh, in our parishes, dioceses, to have, for instance, a parish council. You don't need to have a document in Rome to do that. It's already, you know. So this new phase of the synod is calling us to discern and uh, implement concretely synodality where, uh, where we are. But maybe the main issue is about formation for synodality and co-responsibility <laughs> because uh, to implement this new vision and to be this synodal church, you need to train people to pray, to listen, to discern, to dialogue, to work collaboratively. One of the main issues is a new style of leadership, so a new way to exercise authority, not in a personal authoritarian way, but in a listening uh, style, consultative style, with consultation, and in a more collaborative style. And then the last point in this part is about uh, liturgy, because when you listen to many Catholics about the experience of church uh, and how to journey together, one of the main also very strong topics that come is liturgy. And uh, it's a call also to find, and I know here at Boston College are uh, experienced uh, uh, for that, how to find a more synodal way to celebrate together the, the liturgy. Because the liturgy is the matrix, uh, as I said, for, for, the, for the church. So the call is at the same time a call for inculturation, and we can say that the path of synodality is also a path to foster inculturation, and liturgy is one of an important place. But as we know, and you know, you have this experience also in the United States, but in so many countries now with migration, uh, our societies and churches are more and more diverse, and we need also to uh, foster interculturality. Uh, and it's a creative path, inculturation and interculturality, uh, inter the path of conversion through a necessary uh, synodal dialogue. So I am at the end, <laughs> and I will just uh, conclude uh, by the invitation uh, to embrace this synodal vision. And I really think that uh, it's, uh, this new vision of the church is calling us 
uh, you know, for the reform of the church, you need not only to reform the structure, it's important, but it's also a, a conversion of mentality. And we need also to change our mindset and our pattern uh, from a top-down teaching church. And you can see this image I light. It's Vatican, uh, the First Vatican Council. And you see the way uh, how it is envisioned. The Holy Spirit is only going to the Pope. And uh, the Vatican, uh, First Vatican Council, the idea is really uh, the, we can say, the top of the, of the primacy. <laughs> and the other image is at the Synod on Young People. Uh, and it is uh, the way with this key, we can say, a vision of circularity reciprocity, the idea that the Holy Spirit is working in uh, everybody and through our relationships and dialogue and mutual listening. It's not, the Holy Spirit is not only in the hierarchy, even if we hope <laughs> the Holy Spirit is working through the hierarchy. So I let you with uh, six key elements for, that are at the basis of the synodal vision, uh, the church, people of God on the way. So it's ready to see the church, to retrieve the vision of the church as people of God on the way. And I don't give the detail because I, I don't have time. Second key element, the theology of baptism, really highlighting this equality among all the baptized and the fact that first we are baptized. Pope Francis says, we, uh, all of us, priests, uh, sisters, lay people, we all enter into the church as baptized. So it's reading chapter three of Lumen Gentium on the hierarchy through the lenses and putting the first focus on chapter two on the people of God, uh, all the members of the people of God are united by baptism, and we need to deepen a theology of uh, baptism. That is really this basis for co-responsibility, the common priesthood of all the bataille. Three, so uh, third element, uh, key element for this synodal vision, it's really also uh, integrating and retrieving the authority of the sensus fidei fidelium, the sense of faith given by all the faithful. So you, you, you don't have only the authority of the magisterium, it's very important. <laughs> you have also a kind of authority given to what Sometimes we say the magisterium of the theologians, but you have also the authority given to all the people of God together as uh, sensus fidei. And in the way, a synodal church is a church that acknowledges a kind of plurality of authority in this circularity, and then uh, it's normal that there are tensions. <laughs> But we need to uh, receive those tensions as uh, generative and creative tension. So really, I think this synod, maybe also one of the main issues, is to retrieve the authority of the census fidei and to put it into practice. Then, I have talked a lot about it, but just keep it in mind, this uh, key element, the action of the Holy Spirit, uh, because we can't speak about synodality without uh, looking at the agency of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Then, the fifth element, the diversity of the charisms, the principle of the participation of all in the life of, of the church. And maybe that's really to uh, find ways, you know, to value, to recognize, uh, to empower all charisms that are gifts of God for the service of the community. And the last point is the vision of a relational church based on a relational anthropology. So uh, it's a really uh, calling also for putting relationship at the centers 
and developing new uh, communicative uh, dynamics, as uh, Raphael Luciani often uh, says and writes, <laughs> uh, to become this uh, synodal church. So that is really my last point, <laughs> so that we can put it into practice and you can have time all together uh, to put a relationship at the center and to adopt this relational manner that is the only way through relationships to uh, end on the face. So have a good time. Thank you so much, everyone. In the interest of time, we normally would have conversation right now with your partner, but in the interest of time, I'm sure people have questions for Sister Natalie. So let's just dive into questions. So please raise your hand if you have one and wait for the microphone, and then we'll get to our questions online as well. I don't have a question as much as an observation. Uh, as you've quoted the documents from the Synod, and from and the, the most recent continental document, what strikes me is how inspiring the phraseology and the vocabulary is, and it reminds me very much of the texts of Vatican II, particularly Lumen Gentium and Gaudium et Spes. Well, thank you for your Remark, uh, yes, I, I, I think, as I, as I say, we really leave that in the spirit of the, of the Council. And in a, in a way, the, the last week with this uh, anniversary of the Council, I was really thinking that uh, synodality is a way to articulate and, and to, to take all the texts of Vatican II all together. And uh, in this, with this vision, we can say of an integral approach like Laudato Si, uh, even if uh, it's, uh, but, but going further than the text, you know, uh, in a way what the Synodal Fathers have experienced uh, is what we are called to experience today not only for the bishops, but for all. We have an online question. How should those who support the Synod engage those who don't want to and who see its, cha see its change and therefore a threat to the church? How should those interested engage those who actively hate the Synod and Vatican II because of what has happened through it and since it? It's true that what we see usually is that those who are against the Synod, in fact, they are against Pope Francis and against, against the Council. So uh, how you deal, <laughs> it's not easy because it's, it has been stated by Pope John the, uh, Paul II, that, uh, then by Pope Benedict, that the Council is the compass. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, then I, I think it's also to acknowledge and it's normal and to let people express their fear of change. That's normal, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's part in every organization in all our life when there is a call for change, there are fears. Uh, but then it is helping to uh, people to understand that it is to be faithful <laughs> to the mission of the church from the beginning. And as soon as people have uh, the possibility to have an overview about the history of the church, they can only acknowledge that the church has changed. Um, Uh, mine's kind of a question and kind of more something that I think is uh, more thought-provoking for myself. Um, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? 
Okay. So uh, all through the, the, the presentation, and thank you so much, I can't even imagine the work that this was, <laughs> and I know it's ongoing, but I keep hearing in my own tiny little mind, who are the people who have the hardest time listening, and who are the people who are having the hardest time being heard? Never mind just the change, which, you know, we know there are people that are against synodality um, and, and those things. But I, I'm left to wonder myself, just how do we, as a people, put our faith into action, so to speak, and be open to uh, listening and, and being heard? But I think there's a lot of... Uh, tone deafness or just closing the ears or closing the mouth. And I think that's really an issue that really has to be, and I'm not saying it wasn't attended to, sister. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, but I think that's a hard part for our church. Who has the hardest time listening and who has the hardest time being heard? Y yes. I've grown up in the Catholic church my whole life. And I very rarely felt that I was heard. It didn't deter me from my relationship with God. I'm never going to be anything but a Catholic to this date anyhow. But I think those are real uh, issues that need maybe a little bit more. Um, and I'm not going to say thought because I'm sure a lot of thought was given to this. But how do we reach those who won't listen? And how do we embrace those? Or, or and engage those who think they're never going to be heard, because in our church there are many. Yes, and I think you know many many people in fact feel they are not uh, very much listened to, and it's not easy to listen. So it's really a long path. But among the people you know who also express they are not often, they don't feel they are always listened. You have the priest for instance. And you can't really listen to the others if you don't experience for yourself to be listened to. So it's what we understand also in our context and through the, the synod. And at the end, uh, one of my master in philosophy is Paul Ricoeur. And his, one of his last book was in French, his Parcours de la Reconnaissance. So it's a path of recognition. And we understand that we can't become a I, a subject, without being recognized and in a way listened to, without the, the other. So when you do this listening, uh, there is something of this path of recognition <laughs> that is happening and that allow people uh, to be themselves, to, to grow. But we have to, to learn that and to deepen that. And the only way to really listen to the others is to learn to listen to yourself or to what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. And many times, the difficulty to listen to the others is the difficulty to listen to what the world of the other is doing on you and to listen uh, your inner self, in, in a way. So it's... Uh, and, and we need training and, and, and experimentation and, and, and support. It, it's not natural. <laughs> Even if sometimes I say the first school of synodality is the family. That, you know, and we rediscover also with this synod, we rediscover more the domestic church. In a way, synodality begins in the family that is the first uh, community, community of life and love as it is uh, defined. That's the place where you learn or you don't learn to be listened to, to dialogue and to experience uh, communion. So the family have a, a great role to play also for synodality and we are rediscovering more these links, uh, this link between family and synodality. Um, I'm going to give the mic to someone younger. Oh, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> but I'm actually asking a question about young people, so I appreciate that. Um, thank you for all the gifts that you've given us tonight. Um, my question is, 
What advice or words of encouragement would you give to young people engaging with the synodal process and those that work with young people in this process? Well, what I would say is that I often say is that uh, I'm really convinced, and it's also my experience, that young people are engine of synodality. Because the, the, the culture of young people today usually is more collaborative. They, they, you know, what we have understood through the Synod on Youth is that young people want to be listened to, young people want to be protagonists, and young people uh, awake, reawake the synodality of the church. So there is no other way to become a synodal church than to uh, be <laughs> uh, and to do, uh, to engage uh, young people. To, to, and the only way to reach them and to evangelize them is to co-build with them uh, and to journey with them. That's why the road of Emmaus is really the paradigm for uh, the model for youth ministry. So it's not youth ministry for youth, but with youth. So it's really a key. And uh, we can also say that in Frascati and in our office, and uh, it's also a big challenge for the Vatican and the dicasteries to become more synodal because it's coming from a long culture, very hierarchical. And it's when you have young people with you that you can also help. They are... Uh, protagonists of change. They are change makers, many of them, and they want this synodal church. So it's really a key. You know, those who, are, uh, who really want synodality and can help the church are the young people and the women. <laughs> and as I said, also the poor, the, those on the margin. So it's, it, we need young people. <laughs> we need young people. <laughs> so I guess I got my... Uh, uh, opportunity anyway for, for relinquishing this <laughs> microphone. Um, I have two kinds of questions that are more sort of practical and structural. Thank you very much for this very hopeful presentation, Sir Natalie. Um, the first is, I'm wondering if anyone has done any uh, retroflective um, study of some uh, points in the church where, in a sense, we can look back and say, why did this go wrong? I'm thinking, for example, a very important kind of synodal process here in the United States that was held in conjunction with the 1976 um, 200th anniversary of the Constitution, uh, what was called then the call to action started by the bishops. Okay, it was from a top-down kind of a thing. And I'm also thinking of some dioceses, one I know very well, the one that my community is located in, an archdiocese of Detroit, that said, we are not doing the synodal process because we had a synod six years ago. A lot has happened in six years that mm -hmm. needs to be. So that's one question about, is anyone like looking back and seeing where things might have gone wrong so that it, I mean, I think it's already being corrected in this process. The other question is about media and how the communication is going on in the media. As we all know, we have fake news and all kinds of polarization on all of the various types of social media. And I wonder if you could just speak briefly to either of those if you have anything to say about those concerns. This is very hopeful and energizing and I thank you very much. Yes, thank you also for highlighting the difficulties. And I, as I say, we have written also about the, the difficulties. We are very aware of that. Um, it's true that the, I will begin with the second question about the media. Uh, if you really want, and you see that one of the challenge for this uh, synodal conversion, uh, and I often refer to, if you think, at where we were when Laudato Si was published about the ecological transition or the ecological uh, conversion. And where we are now, it's not finished, but uh, you know, through many networks, actions, uh, there are more sensibilization. So, so we have already moved and we will continue. And, and uh, there is an urgent call to change, but we can see also all the resistance uh, to implement uh, Lauda to see and to... Um, so to do that, 
uh, and to do the, the synodal conversion or synodal transition, uh, because we, it's the same dynamic in a way as the ecological uh, transition. You need to communicate to promote and to find ways to put people on board. So communication is a key and has to be at the center of, uh, of the synodal process. That's why also from the beginning we have hired someone uh, for communication. And, but it, it's, it's the role of everybody. <laughs> It's, it's not just the role of a communication manager, you know. And in fact, all my experience is that synodality spread by capillarity. It's it not just in a top-down way with a good communication. And the most uh, maybe key factor for the synod that has allowed also that uh, almost all the countries bishops conference have taken part is that we have uh, done many many zoom sessions with uh, all the uh, presidents of bishops conference but also we have created a platform synod resources to uh, uh, put on this platform all the initiatives the best practices the tools of others. So it's the idea, and that's the new vision of synodality. It's not just a process coming, you know, from a center. It's allowing, uh, empowering the grassroots to be creative, to be actors, and sharing uh, with, the plus, with the platform. So it, it's exactly with this idea of circularity. It's nobody alone but things can change, uh, you know, in a diocese because uh, the bishop's conference is moving or another diocese. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, all together by this capillarity. So everybody has a role to play in communication. Then it's true that you feel the same polarity in a way in the church as in the society. <laughs> So uh, what is happening with fake news, you know, is we can see the results in politics, but also in the church. And we have to find ways, good ways to counteract that. Uh, that's true. Uh, and then for the second question, I would say we have to be aware, as I have said from the beginning, you know, the most important for synodality and for the synodal uh, path is patience, <laughs> perseverance, <laughs> because it's very long. And we feel that uh, 60 years after the Council is already a long uh, history. But in fact, if you look at all the history of the church, it's very short. <laughs> the application of the Council of Trent took more than 100 uh, years. Uh, and uh, we are still in a period of transition, 60 years after the Council, but we inherit of an undercurrent, still very strong, of more than 1,500 of vision of the church that led to a perfect society, pyramidal, hierarchical. So it's still in our mind. How many times you speak about the church as uh, the bishops and the priests, not including you? It's the old model. <laughs> we should never speak about them and us. No, we are all together. We can't think about us without being interdependent and in the same uh, journey or community with all the diversity of the people of God. And you can't let uh, one part on the, <laughs> on the side. So it's starting from the reality where people are and, and trying to find consensus. That's why it's long and not easy. Sister Nathalie, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And we're so intensely proud of the marvelous work that you're doing. Uh, with this great movement, and I'm totally convinced of this synodal path. And in fact, the question I was going to raise reflects a sad lack of faith on my part and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think I'm going to pa pass on my question 
Uh, I'm going to go home and pray about it instead. But thank you so much. It's been marvelous.